Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. We ended the previous unit on the puzzle of specifiers. In particular, the fact that we only had one specifier, which was a determiner, and it didn't bear the same kind of relationship that other modifiers bore to head nouns in that it wasn't a phrase. In this unit, we're going to talk a little bit about how functional categories seem to be um, broken out into X-bar theory. In particular, we're going to start with DPs, we're also going to consider CPs, TPs, aspect, various kinds of aspect phrases and voice phrases. But let's start with DPs. Now, DPs, um, determiners are a bit of a puzzle because our specifier rule as we did it, and admittedly this was a stipulation, was that there can only be um, a phrasal element in that position, and we already know that we, for the most part, we can't have more than one determiner. So you can't say those, uh, that the book. There are some exceptions, like those two books and all the books, and we'll come back to those. Um, but it's not clear what are the what are the phrases that that are determiners if they sit in specifier positions. This puzzle. Um, was taken up by a number of linguists in the late 1980s, and they decided that uh, there might be a good argument to claim that DPs are not specifiers themselves, but Ds are heads that take noun phrases as complements. This is um, the proposal made by Abney in 1987 that in fact noun phrases sits a, sit as complements, remember complements, to the determiner, um, rather than the determiner sitting in the specifier of the noun phrase. This is called the DP proposal. Now one thing that's very important here is notice that the, that the DP does not sit in the specifier of the noun phrase. And we have a reason for that, we're going to come back to that a little bit later because we're going to reserve that position for something else. Instead, the noun phrase is the complement to the determiner, and the determiner projects up in X-bar theory to a DP. This explains a number of things. First of all, it explains why the determiner isn't a phrase. It's because it's the head of its own phrase. That's why, you, in the most cases, you only have one. Second thing we notice, uh, by the way, is we now have no examples of, of specifiers. We have to come back and fix that problem. So let's now talk a little bit about what kind of evidence we have for these DP structures that Abney proposed. The um, evidence we're going to look at comes from what we call S genitives. These are genitives that show up on nouns when you say things like the man's coat. Now you might think that this apostrophe S is simply a suffix that we mark um, orthographically with an apostrophe. Among other things, it follows English phonological rules like a suffix. It's man's and cat's and glasses. So it has all the phonological properties of a suffix in that it, it's, it assimilates in the voice to the noun that it uh, attaches to. However, there's a, a fair amount of evidence that this is not, in fact, a normal suffix. Um, so here's a piece of evidence that it isn't. It doesn't always attach to nouns. So for example, you can say, the woman standing over there's coat. And the apostrophe S doesn't go on the head noun. It doesn't go on woman. It goes on the last word in the phrase containing woman. Similar example, the dancer from New York's shoes. And that apostrophe S goes on New York. But clearly the possessive goes as associated with dancer, not with New York. This kind of structure is what's known as a clitic. It's, a clitics are affixes that attach, seem to at least, attach to phrases rather than attach to individual headwords. Um, 
And as such, it has a, a particular interest to us because it marks the edges of certain kinds of phrases. The second thing we're going to note about this apostrophe S is that um, it's actually in complementary distribution with real determiners. So the woman standing over there's coat, you'll notice there's no determiner on coat. Instead, the apostrophe S seems to stand in place of a determiner. The woman standing over there's the coat is terrible. And the reason for that is apostrophe S is in complementary distribution with a determiner associated with the, with the possessed noun. Um, it, of course, is not in complementary distribution with the determiner that sits on the, uh, on the noun woman in this sentence, right? That determiner is associated with woman. Um, we can compare the S genitive to the free genitive, and in the free genitive, you can have a determiner on that second noun, the coat of the man. So you can't say the, the woman's the coat, but you can say the coat of the man, where you have, that, you have those two uh, determiners, one on coat and one on man. So that's an interesting property, and um, we'd ideally like to explain why that complementarity exists. Well, remember that complementarity um, means something in phonology. When you have something in complementary distribution, that means that the two items are examples of the same thing. So, for example, if you have an aspirated P and an unaspirated P, and you can predict the, the um, distribution of one of those, that means that those are both um, allophones of the same phony. Well, the same thing seems to be here true here, too. We have two items that are in complementary distribution. That probably means that they're items of the same type. And in particular, the apostrophe S and the the, because they are in complementary distribution with each other, are both determiners of the category determiner. So, here's one possible proposal. Apostrophe S is a determiner. That explains the complementarity effects. But if you put it in this position, you have a bit of a mystery. Where on earth does that possessor sit? The woman standing over there's hat. Where's that noun phrase that contains the woman standing over there? So having this determiner in a specifier position um, leaves us with something unexplained about the positioning of the noun phrases. If we were to make an alternative hypothesis, the hypothesis of uh, that uses DPs, where the determiner is uh, a head that takes the noun phrase as a complement, there actually is a clear position for the possessive noun phrase. The woman standing over there's hat. That DP, the woman standing over there, sits in the specifier of the determiner um, phrase headed by the apostrophe S. I've labeled the two different determiners here as one and two, so you can keep them apart. Um, the DP1 is headed by D1, which is the apostrophe S, and DP2 is headed by the determiner the that holds over the woman. Um, this then explains why it should be the case that you have um, an item that is in complementary distribution with determiners functioning in the position it does. It explains why it appears at the end of these possessive noun phrases. This is the only place it could go. So, um, one more thing to think about before we sign off on this video. Notice that what we've done here is we've drawn in uh, this DP2 the possessor DP, in the specifier of the uh, DP1. Now, I've hinted to you before that we're going to use specifiers for a purpose. We're going to use specifiers as the positions of subjects. So one possibility here is to think of possessors as the subjects of DPs. Just think about that possibility. We have just one more thing to think about, about our DP hypothesis. And that is, what about those noun phrases that don't have determiners? 
The one good thing about our old phrase structure rule was that, der that determiners were marked as optional. But if determiners are head that take noun phrases as complements, we might predict that they really should be obligatory. And in fact, we would want all those cases where we previously had drawn noun phrases to appear to now be DPs, because we want determiner phrases wherever we can to make our rules consistent. Well, um, we're left with the puzzle of what about those noun phrases like proper names or bare plurals like one or people, where um, there doesn't appear to be a determiner. Okay, put your hand on your wallet, Run, turn away from me because I'm about to pull some fast magic. But in the end, this is a piece of magic we're going to use a lot because it explains a lot of things. We're going to claim that in, um, in all languages, there can be determiners that are null. They're determiners that you simply can't hear. Um, so a proper name might have a determiner on it that's a proper name determiner. Now, what kind of evidence would we have for making this sort of radical claim? One piece of evidence would come from the fact that in many other languages, proper names can take determiners. It just so happens that English is a language that doesn't do it. There are some, a few cases where English does, like, for example, where you say the Smiths. Um, there are also cases where English has determiners that other languages don't. So, for example, in English, we have the indefinite determiner a or an, but in Irish, there is no such determiner. So we, we would want to claim that in Irish, those indefinite determiners are there, they just happen to be null. This is going to be a common strategy for us for explaining the absence of functional categories, to claim that we have null functional categories. They're there structurally, but they have no phonological content.